Hello everyone, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Louisa Morse. I am the Division Chair of SDR, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event on doing impactful and relevant research in strategic management. This year, SDR running several symposia and events on impact and relevance, and therefore we have this very ni nice background on impact and relevance. So please keep an eye on the STR homepage or social media for advertisements of the next events. I'm sure that we're going to have a very interesting conversation today. And thank you very much to all of the panelists for being here uh, and participating. And also, of course, to Richard Whittington for organizing this session. I'm going to hand over to Richard now to introduce the event and today's speakers. Thank you, Louise, and welcome to everybody. And apologies for any of you who... Um got uh, uh, the wrong invitation for the wrong time. I'm so glad you've joined, managed to join us anyway. We have a wonderful panel. We'll be starting with Julian Birkinshaw of London Business School, then moving on to Rudy Durand of HSA France, Paula Jasikowski, early morning, early riser from the University of Queensland, Joe Mahoney from Illinois, and then a practitioner. Martin Reeves, Chairman of the Henderson Institute, the Research Institute of the Boston Consulting Group, and a very academically engaged practitioner. And in a sense, Martin epitomizes that bridging function that we're all aspiring to, I think, here. And the subject for today is how to make that bridge stronger and more effective between academia and practice. Martin will finish off, off and be able to reflect on our own academic contributions. The intention is to have roughly 10 to 12 minute presentations. I shall do my best to chair these guys. I know they have lots of interesting things to say. Allow perhaps one question between each presentation. But what we'd like you to do particularly, and I've encouraged uh, all the presenters to respond to this, is to use the chat. So if you have a particular question, put it in the chat. If you have a suggested reference, a good source for others, put it in the chat. And if you have a good response to a question, please put that in the chat too. The chat will be a continuous interactive dialogue which will be going on. We are recorded, so um, we will also be able to pursue this on the AOM website later. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with Julian Birkinshaw of London Business School, and um, he's got 10 or 12 minutes to start us off with. Please, Julian. Thank you very much, Richard and Louisa. Um, and there you go. You should be able to see my slides. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Good. Excellent. So real pleasure to do this. 10 minutes to share my thoughts on uh, rigor and relevance in search of impact. Um, questions that I think a lot of us worry about a lot. Um, I'm going to just quickly define what I mean by impact, changing how people in business, the real world of business, think and act. So as strategy scholars, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find ways of helping leaders of companies, strategy makers in those companies, strategy office or whatever, um, think about the issues that they face and, and, and make better decisions. And, and if you kind of take a real helicopter view of this, I, I would say there's three kind of classic pathways. Um, the teaching piece, I'm not even gonna talk about, this is our bread, bread and butter. Uh, all of us, ha I believe, have some sort of job uh, in terms of shaping the minds of our students, whether these are very young students or whether these are executives to help them look at the world differently. I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about the research part of this, and then a little bit towards the end on what I'm gonna call active intervention. Uh, and a few tips along the way for both of these. Um, the goal of strategy research obviously is to try to, to create new knowledge, uh, knowledge which is both new as well as salient and usable. And when I was kind of preparing this, I, I said to myself, well, what are the uh, what are the pieces of knowledge which which are, have been the most useful over the years? And everyone's got their own list. I'm not even going to go through that list. It's pretty obvious that some big ideas have shaped the way that we look at the world. But unfortunately, being able to identify some of those big ideas 
doesn't actually necessarily mean that we're doing a good job as strategy researchers collectively at shaping the way that the real business world does strategy. Um, and if you look, I couldn't get as many numbers as I wanted to, but there's been this crazy growth in the number of business academics out there. I managed to find some UK data, almost unbelievable, 17,000 people. I mean, I, do I believe that? They're not all active researchers, but this is people who are employed in some capacity in the world of management and business academia across 139 institutions in the UK. And of course, you can grow that number proportionally into the different countries around the world. I didn't even attempt to find the number of academic articles that have been published. Clearly, it's just been going up year after year. And for, for all those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of articles written every year, we only have a tiny number that actually seem to really make any impact whatsoever. If you're trying to take a comparative view, uh, my colleague Gary Hamill, many of you will know Gary, he did a little bit of analysis of NSF funding in the US and he reckoned only about 1% of that money actually went to business and management. Um, and if you look at the SMS itself, something like fewer than 1% of SMS members actually identify as executives or consultants. So I do worry that we're not having as much impact uh, as we really should do. So my, my offering for the next three minutes is just a few tips from my own experience. This is kind of me sharing my reflections on what I've done for a 25 year career. And also looking, I think, at what some other people on this panel and, and other good friends have done. Uh, and this is advice to particularly those of you who are a bit earlier on in your careers about trying to find ways of doing research, which has a greater chance of actually having an impact on the business world. I've always done research based on real world phenomena. I've never looked for gaps in the literature. I've always looked for kind of gaps almost in terms of the gap between what people are talking about in the literature and what real business executives are worrying about. And when they've got problems that we aren't addressing, for me, that's always been an opportunity. I've always collected data inside companies as well, because for me, the objective sort of distant collection of data almost always loses something in translator. So I realize it's sort of harder to publish this stuff, but it actually at least convinces me anyway that what I'm doing is studying the real phenomena in their in their real sort of in, in the flesh rather than somebody's interpretation of them. I've always attempted to write articles that address at least two audiences. So every time I write an academic article, I've always attempted to also write a version of it for Slow Management Review or Harvard Business Review or, or some such journal. And for me, a good acid test of a, of a worthwhile article to write is that it actually can be sort of sent to at least two different audiences like that. And then finally, um, a certain restlessness in terms of the topics that I study. I mean, I've always in some sort of strange way admired people who can continue to push the same sort of agenda year after year. Some people have literally spent their entire careers looking at specific phenomena or topics or whatever. And, and that's always been kind of, perhaps I, I should have done that in terms of being even more productive, but, but frankly, I just get a bit bored looking at the same thing. So I'm always looking for something a little bit new. I'm always trying to be a little bit contrarian in my point of view, not, not radical, but just trying to say the world doesn't look quite like people thought it was. So uh, the Harvard Business Review thing I wrote a couple of years back called How Incumbents Survive and Thrive. That was my attempt to say, you know, everybody tells us that the world is being disrupted and that the, you know, the unicorns are taking over from the dinosaurs. Well, if you actually look at the Fortune 500, you know, 480 out of those 500 companies have existed in that list for more than 30 years, since before the digital revolution started. And that was the starting point in that particular piece for reminding everybody that there's actually an awful lot of inertia in the system, as well as a certain amount of disruption. And that's the sort of article, frankly, which, which doesn't just get noticed by, by academics, but it also gets noticed by business people. So there you go, that's a few little tips. Uh, one study I, I did a couple of years ago, which I'm just going to acknowledge, I'm not gonna spend very long on it at all, but Richard said in his intro that we're sort of looking for bridges between academia 
and the business world. And I did this piece with a couple of colleagues, Ramon and Patrick, where we looked specifically at what we call bridge journals. So if you think about the slow management review, that is a journal written with practitioners in mind. It also has sites. It actually has articles referred to in it. And our big idea in this paper, if you like, was what sort of articles, academic articles, actually get picked up by people who are writing in slow management review. The theory is that they're the ones who are doing research, which is actually more translatable into management practice. So by all means, you know, read in your own time. It came out in the Academy of Management, Learning and Education. Um, and the essence of the article was that the articles that got cited in slow management review, they were either beacons, big ideas. They were sometimes walking sticks, sort of almost conceptual pieces that helped us make sense of kind of tricky difficult to understand phenomena or concepts. Or they were, I call them brooms. In other words, they were sort of sweeping up an entire literature and making it accessible in a way that the, 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 lay, the lay person, if you like, might be able to, uh, to pick up. And, and we also discovered, no surprise at all, that the more inductive studies typically got much more cited than the, the, the hypothetical deductive type studies. So there you go. I'm going to spend one more minute, if that's OK, before I hand over to the next speaker. Um, I said I was going to touch on active intervention. Um, and I think this is a, an area where we can and should do a much better job. It's so easy just to talk about doing academic research where we are standing away from the phenomenon and observing it. I think we can get more involved. And I'm deliberately not using the word consulting here. I'm talking about what you might call action research. Uh, and and the, the motivation here is very simple. You will probably remember um, Oticon, the Danish hearing aid company, came up with a thing called the Spaghetti Organization. And I tracked all the citations to articles written on Oticon Spaghetti Organizations. The journalists picked up on it almost as soon as it happened. The consulting companies picked up on it a few years later. I mean, the, the first study was like one year later and there was a steady stream of interest. We academics, I mean, literally 15 years after it happened, literally after people had stopped actually doing what we were talking about in Oticon. I mean, Oticon had given up on its spaghetti organization at the time when academics actually started writing about it in a serious way. And that's that's a kind of a shame. I mean, I'm not saying that's a useless endeavor. I'm saying that, you know, I would love us to be a little bit closer to the cutting edge in terms of actually not just you know, uh, following up on stories, but starting to make sense of them as they happen. So is there scope for us as researchers to be more proactive in shaping leading edge practice? I think there is. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Gary Hamill, uh, created with my help, I think, called the Management Lab a few years ago, which was trying to do exactly that. Um, and my, I'm moving to Ivy Business School in Canada shortly, uh, and Tima Bansal and her team there have created an entity called Innovation North, which again is working with leading companies to try to work, co-create knowledge with them by both, as it were, solving their problems and making sense of the solutions for an academic and practitioner audience. I mean, for me, that's what the cutting edge of good academic research is. I don't have long enough tonight, of course, to actually kind of share my detailed thoughts on it. But for me, that's where we should be doing what we should be doing more of. Uh, and I encourage those of you who have any interest to perhaps have a chat with me after about how we might be able to do that. I will stop there. Apologies if I went a little bit over, Richard, but I'm going to stop talking right now. Thank you so much, Julian. That was tremendous. And you weren't over time. So oh, that's very good. Thank you very much. So you've just told us that uh, we're all Johnny come lately to yeah. phenomena such as Oticon. Does yeah. anyone have a response or a question they want to put to Julian? Please do. Indeed, the panel can too. Or stick it in the chat. Um, I think I'll make a, an amplifying comment, if I may. Go on. Um, so I, I carried out a similar exercise on um, 50 ideas that have shaped management over the past 50 years. And I looked, where did, they, where did they come from? Who did what with them? And we found a similar thing, Julian. Uh, we found that um, uh, academics on the whole came late to topics and stuck with them. 
we found that consultants often saw them early but failed to codify them. They didn't know what they knew. We found that most new ideas in business actually originally came from business. So mm. there's a sort of a knowledge management and mobilization problem um, to, 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 to solve here was our conclusion, which I think supports what you're saying. Yeah, completely. And, and you know, when like the balanced scorecard is a famous example, that was Robert Kaplan, but it wasn't Robert Kaplan, actually. It was this, this guy, I can't even remember, Art Schneiderman was his name, that's right. Art Schneiderman invented the, uh, the balanced scorecard, as it were. Um, Bob Kaplan sort of codified it, and arguably they kind of needed each other for this to then become part of the way that we kind of looked at the business of balancing your 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 measurement system. So there is a sort of mutual dependency, but but it's indeed, as you say, Martin, absolutely the case that the the innovations, the management innovations, almost certainly, almost always happen because of the practicing manager, not the academic, doing it first. Sorry. Thank you, Julian. Very provocative. And thanks, Martin, for uh, adding this perspective from your, your experience and data. I think there's a nice con uh, question, I think, from Paula, but we can probably deal with these in the uh, chat. And also, Amin has put something into the chat. So please do, let's use the chat. Thanks, Paula, for um, uh, beginning the conversation there. So next, please. Could we have Rudy? Rudy, are you there? I'm, I'm there. Can you see my screen? Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. So the, the title of my presentation um, uh, for, uh, for this is uh, Practitioners as Ordinary Theorists. And so I have like a four uh, uh, leg um, argument, so to speak, but kind of uh, circular. So the starting point, why uh, uh, actually I, I think I am in this panel probably because actually over the years, uh, I started a lot uh, as a deductive uh, scholar and more and more uh, started to notice that uh, uh, I, I could help some practitioners solve uh, some of their uh, uh, problems so that, that I am now part of some boards, purpose committees, impact committees and other things. And that I have been actually over the years uh, a, a, a founder of an institute it's called Society and Organizations, and uh, a, a center that gathers actually practitioners and, 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 and researchers. Last week, for instance, we had an event with 240 people, 110 practitioners, and the rest more uh, academics. And I also uh, developed uh, this knowledge in books, uh, such as uh, the one with the uh, Veolia CEO, or the other one is in French, but for pedagogical purposes, is actually a dialogue between 12 CEOs in France and, and 12 students from my institution. But uh, um, the, the interest, I think, comes uh, from these experiences and what can be transferred to uh, research, but from practice. And it's interesting as an academic to be in practice and bring back the, uh, the, the knowledge. And you see here that in this article, uh, um, there is a citation uh, from Roland Calori who, is, who was one of my mentors uh, back in the days. And he wrote this thing in an article. He said the epistemological separation between the author of theories, the researcher, and the research subjects of theories, the practitioners, leaves practical knowledge unexploited and creates and maintains a conformist and elitist view of management studies, which further restrains the dialogue between academic authors and real life actors. And I was very much inspired, although at the time when I met him, I, I did not understand that. Uh, um, uh, and it actually, it's only after the financial crisis, 2008, that I started thinking, I mean, why am I playing this academic game, being separated from practice and doing things that actually kind of in a sort of ivory tower that doesn't help the people who are actually committing mistakes unwillingly or uh, looking uh, for solutions, uh, but not finding them. And therefore... This is the original article from uh, from Roland, Ordinary uh, Theorist in Mixed Industries, where he used the narratives of the practitioners uh, to develop and co-construct uh, a, a theoretical argument. And so I think that if you'd like to play uh, uh, this and actually learn from practice as much as you can bring a knowledge, uh, I would just share with you what I did and how I changed in my journey in research and academia. Uh, and I would have just simply two uh, uh, steps. The first one is organize yourself. As much as you go to academic conferences, I think that you have to go to contact uh, with these uh, practitioners. 
So um, immerse yourself in uh, practitioner conferences on your topic, of course. Is it AI? Is it uh, MNEs? Is it uh, learning in uh, and within teams or whatever? Uh, try to be part of these social networks, groups, and association. I see too often my junior colleagues who stay for years, six years, eight years, uh, just in their office doing their academic research and actually being almost uh, 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 frightened, uh, <laughs> scared by, by the practitioners, thinking that they will not be able to communicate. I think you have just to, uh, you know, uh, basically cross the Rubicon and go and talk to them. Uh, when you do this, as Roland uh, was saying, Roland Calerie, he said he used this term lay ontologies. I think that you can start uh, uh, understanding the way they view the world and actually you can start speaking the same language as them. And as as many of us who speak multiple languages, you know how good it is actually to be a translator um, uh, from one language to another and to discover some areas that, uh, you know, <clears throat> Semantic spaces uh, enable us to to discover and and uh, and uh, and research. So then you should create opportunities for conversations and funding. So, um, uh, I'm, Julian just mentioned teaching. You know, teaching. Invite these uh, practitioners and have conversation, have lunches with with, with them. Uh, uh, make uh, you know projects with students working in these companies. Try to write mini cases or a pedagogical. Uh, uh, um, infrastructures uh, for you just to convey the messages of these companies and actually balance their practical view with uh, your academic view. Um, contract uh, with them for some research, a small research project at the beginning and maybe later on for uh, more chairs. With the Institute at HEC Paris, we had over the years dozens of chairs that came from this first instantiation of conversation and uh, uh, spaces that we created uh, between uh, us and, and them. And very importantly, I think that Julian, you took the example of um, just before of the, um, uh, what was the example? Just uh, the, the, the word is just escaping me. Uh, not um, uh, anyway, uh, um, the card. Um, uh, so it, you had the small card yes, one. Small no. card. Sorry, yeah. sorry. So you you had the two uh, the alliance of two, of two people. The same thing. I mean, instead of, of of going you alone, just try to find the other people in your institution, in some other institutions, like Tima Bansal did, for instance, as we mentioned, and ally and just create a bigger surface for the practitioners to get and meet with you with, between them, because you can invite more practitioners. And with more academics, and this is what we what we did uh, at SNO, and we could have five chairs at the same time with five professors coming from multiple departments, developing each one topic uh, of research with uh, uh, each of the different companies. So you can gain money from these companies in this example uh, on independent but connected research projects, and therefore uh, leading to some uh, interesting uh, uh, research uh, with impact at least for the companies, but uh, more broadly. Listen, I think the, the problem that we have is that we, we don't listen to people who do not speak exactly the same language as us. So the practitioners say certain things that we need to transform and translate. We need to have their lay ontologies in order to be able to communicate and actually connect the dots. Um, so I'm not exactly the same kind of Julian because I was starting from the gap in the theory, but trying actually to map out these gaps into uh, the uh, cognitive uh, landscapes uh, that these uh, people were presenting uh, to me. Then once you have done that, you can pick in your domain of interest uh, 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 one topic and have a deep, deep conversation with them around it. So listen to, the, to their questions and their ordinary uh, theorization, or ordinary theories. See what we know already from our own theories and what actually is missing. And then you can elaborate research programs and uh, uh, develop uh, projects. And what we were doing is that we were inviting them every six months and one, one big event, event every year, connecting different people from these companies that were coming on campus. This is just one example, of course, uh, and discussing across their own problems on this, uh, uh, on this defined, uh, defi defined topic. Then you can go back and listen to their reaction, elaborate, and at the same time as you are delivering uh, some uh, snippets and nuggets of knowledge to them, you progressively walk on your own on your own paper uh, and you talk to you 
your main audience in this case to have the the the, the paper published. Also, then you start slowly because you have invited them. You created the space for conversation, whether in teaching, whether in some, you know, dinner types or clubs types, uh, etc. You, you can start accept invitation to broaden your scope of reflection, being a panelist in their own in events, uh, being a moderator of, of uh, some events where uh, um, associations and groupings that you were uh, actually immersing yourself uh, actually start to inviting you as a different kind of light, a different kind of uh, 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 proposals, propositions to, to about their problems can become a scientific advisor or some research, applied research of their own, but connecting more and more people. And so you start snowballing and having an impact through not just your own research, but the research of the groups of people that you have connected uh, to them, with them. So, uh, so the end point is that if you do this regularly, basically you can start having one good idea a year with one company and start with the research publication process while trying to push this. And so here, I listed some of the papers here that the written papers, and each of them is has been sourced from discussions or even a convention or contract that was signed with the firm. But for instance, on impact investing, it's a public bank investment. On this one, it's actually the activity as a, a public committee. This one is uh, a, the, a public uh, benefit organization in France. Uh, this one is a discussion with the CEO of uh, uh, Danone, who was attacked by headphones activists. Uh, this one is actually uh, uh, an alumna met at uh, um, um, an, uh, the uh, alumni association, who had a problem and a difficulty of how to transfer the CSR practices within her company. This one is a, a, a discussion by uh, a company that is on all the different rankings uh, dangerous sustainability index and all multiple rankings on, on CSR and asking the question, do investors value the, the, this fund? What I mean is that this is just my, you know, uh, experience and how I completely changed the way I was thinking about research through the conversation that my one of my mentors, Ronald Carroway, helped me see uh, uh, with this, his reflection about, you know, uh, avoiding the gap, the, the, the wedge that uh, there is between what we think we are doing, and I think Julian showed that we are late and that maybe we are no, no, not even more relevant, whereas lots of people, many more than we think in the practice are looking for uh, and welcoming conversations with their own language, with their uh, lay uh, theories, uh, theorizations uh, about phenomena that we are all interested in, I think. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rudy. And uh, wonderful too to see uh, Roland Calor's uh, name up there um, and the, the notion of lay ontologies. You also provide some very inspiring examples of first class research, which has come out of working with practitioners. Congratulations and thank you. If there's anyone got a question or a reflection, again, from the panel, if you wish, I notice there's quite a lot of chat going on. The more chat, the better. Um, uh, indeed, uh, Rudy, you might want to pick up on some of those issues as you go along. Um, <clears throat> anyone want a minute or two and then, then we will go on otherwise. Does anyone want to raise a, ideally a virtual hand, please? Is that Martin? That's not quite a, a virtual hand. But yeah, I can't, I can't find my virtual hand, so I'm afraid you'll have to have a real one, if that's okay. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, just just to sort of uh, underline the language as one of the one of the topics here, lay ontologies and so on. Uh, I think um, I think there are a number of language problems in the field. Um, uh, we we sometimes call relevant ideas things that are difficult to understand for lay people. I mean, I think resource based competition would be, you know, something that's very important but hardly understood by any practitioner, as far as I can tell. Um, also, I think um, you know uh, synonymous approaches. I mean, one of the things, one of the problems finding practice is that there are now so many ideas and frameworks that even seasoned strategists cannot explain the connection between uh, blue ocean strategy and resource-based competition and classical. It, it, it just what is a synonym of what and what belongs with what? Um, so perhaps that's that's an area where we can. Um, I mean, it may boil down in large part to speaking plain plain English when we when we uh, when we speak to those multiple audiences that uh, Julian talked about. Yeah, 
there is a linguistic problem, but most of us are in the executive education classroom and that's where we're tested exactly. and usually fairly effective. Um, so that's something to reflect on as we go forward. I, we do communicate adequately in certain for at least. Now, okay, well, look, that was very helpful, Rudy, and um, some wonderful examples. I think that would allow Paula to move on. And I think she has some similar, but also different things to say. Okay, so I uh, really appreciated the prior conversations and hope to build a little on those. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to recognize impactful questions throughout my career. I'm quite fortunate in that the first big project I had after my PhD was an Advanced Institute of Management Goshal Fellowship. And one of the requirements of this funding was that we had to have impact. We had to demonstrate impact as part of the deliverables whilst we were going through. And I think the very valuable thing for me, and maybe for those of you who have been raised in a traditional qualitative method where you believe that there's that you mustn't contaminate the field, is that, I mean, our job was to actually involve practitioners in our research and not to see this as contaminating the field, but rather co-creating with them. So I had to learn to run workshops with the kinds of people who were, um, I was researching and that was very helpful for me because I also had to learn to develop like interim reports, things that were valuable to them that would make them want to come to a workshop. And uh, that just did a lot in getting me over maybe some of my own fears and phobias about both research methods, uh, but also whether I would have something to say to them that hadn't already been through peer review. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that process because I'm an active practitioner in the field I've been studying. I've been studying the disaster insurance field for, um, gosh, it's nearly 20 years now. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how my nose has been led by the questions that come up as a participant in that field. Um, but the first thing I think I'd like to just say is I'd like us to go to the definitions of impact that are used by things like research councils, um, simply because this is how it defines impact. This is, and I've had two impact case studies, maybe three, I can't remember, whatever, for my uh, institution. So I know how to do the impact thing that's required. Um, but if you look at this, an effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, beyond academia, um, and I do wonder to myself, how helpful is this for you as a young scholar uh, or an early career scholar if you want to do impactful research? And I think some of the problems here are that what might have a benefit to economy, the society, et cetera, may not be the things that policymakers are looking for or that you can affect or change. So I just want to bring that little bit of a note into our conversation that every senior manager, every policymaker, every CEO is actually not looking for your great answers necessarily, but that doesn't mean that they're not great answers. So I just want us to temper some of our beliefs about impact in that sense. But uh, if you look at the literature on impact, and there's a growing uh, body of literature on this, we get this concept of th three things that happen in a process. First, you publish your paper, then you translate it, making that research accessible. Uh, and I think Julian talked a bit about that in terms of trying to get multiple outputs. Um, when you're designing your research, you should co-create. So you're going to do a research study. You should go and involve practitioners in what do they think are the relevant questions and how they might want to work with you on researching those questions or giving you access. And finally, and I think this is a little more contentious, it's the area which I think Rudy spoke to, of you know, engage, be in the workshops, be in the conferences, be in the field. You are also performing the field you're working in because as people, you research people, you engage them in reflexive action. They reflect on what they do because you work with them. But the things that we mostly think of in our in our um, research is, you know, I wrote my AMJ paper um, and here's one we wrote. And I mean, you know, I challenge you to read that abstract. Even my mother who was very fond of me when she was alive, probably would have struggled to be interested enough to read the abstracts of my academic papers. But what you do get when you read one of these is that you will also get from the academy the opportunity to write an insights article afterwards. Unfortunately, it goes behind a paywall one month after you've actually written it. So I'm not sure how helpful it is to practitioners because it goes back behind the academy paywall. But at least this is a much more interesting looking thing to read. You know, so it's a nice translation of an AMJ because it's interesting. It shows you something you might be interested in. 
But some of the things you can do, and this is what we did after we'd written that piece, it, the piece didn't come out till sometime in 2022, but we, as soon as we knew it was accepted, wrote a piece for the conversation. And the conversation is a great place to write an 800 word piece. Um, they really help you write them. So that's one of the things I want you to understand. If they accept your paper, they really help you to get into writing in a way that is accessible. And a lot of your work will get picked up by the media that way as well. So it's really worth thinking about ways to do translation. But I think the thing I really want to talk about today is not so much translation, because that's one we already know, and while it's not easy to do, good quality translation, um, and Julian's obviously an expert because he often gets additional papers in the kind of practitioner journals, um, is that these things are not linear, and that for me, translation is too late for the field that I move in. Okay, so I need to think of something to do before that. So I'll talk a little bit about my impact journey. And one of the things I want to encourage you to think about is have, how you, as you're going through the field, you develop an impact object, something you can talk to your practitioners about, informed by the field that they are in, that allows them to engage in their field in a different way. And I'm going to talk about our most recent one, um, which is about protect what a, a, a a term we coined called protection gap entities. Now, we studied that field from 2016, to be honest, I'm still studying it a bit, um, uh, from 2016. But in 2018, we thought we had enough going on to release a report about protection gap entities and their relationship to catastrophic risk. What they are is essentially not-for-profit insurance mechanisms that are government legislated but operate between industry and market in order to cover gaps in protection, but it's not what they do or what they are that's so important, but that what a protection, what a, what a impact object is, is something that you can develop a set of diagnostics and tools around that help the field to cluster. And what was valuable for me is we were studying a global problem, but every practitioner is interested in what's going on in their local situation. It's difficult for them to abstract to something uh, that is sufficiently field relevant that they can understand it. So it's got to be the language of the field, and but it's also got to be something that they can coalesce around. And this was something that we ran a workshop on the report that we did. We invited field practitioners from around the world. And here's the sorts of things that they said to which, which was that they'd all seen themselves as being engaged in something very different. But our report, our impact object, gave them a way to have conversations with each other. So that's really good. And it's, a, it's part of me performing the field. Um, and that performing the field is happening before publication. And um, as a result, that report got picked up quite a lot. Here's just a few things that got picked up in a lot of places, but it's cited in government terrorism insurance legislation. So about renewing the Insurance Terrorism Act. It was um, used for a European Commission on Nuclear Liabilities, which somewhat surprised me. Hadn't seen myself in that field. Um, and also practitioners began to draw on it and publish it for their own interests. And their own interests don't necessarily marry yours or necessarily even reflect what you intended. So I want you to think about an impact object is what's coming out of your work. How can you crystallize it prior to publication? It will help push your own thinking, um, but it will have a life of its own. And I think that's one of the contentious things we should study. And it's a little bit in the chat about how do we get stuff out pre-publication? Pre because we know after publication that at least three people and an editor liked your paper, um, whereas pre-publication, you need a lot of confidence. Um, and that's difficult because co-creating is actually contentious. And I want to share with you a little experience that happened to me uh, after we released um, a book in 2015 on making a market for acts of God. It dealt with the global reinsurance sector and some fundamental changes in the trading of that in that sector. I was really thrilled um, after a one hour interview with an FT journalist, long, long interview, um, that we got the front page of the FT companies and markets. It was a little confusing to me that this was the headline because it seemed to take three pages in the mm -hmm. penultimate chapter a bit out of context. Nonetheless, we thought, well, that's great. We're on the front page. This will start a conversation about our book. And it certainly did, because two days later, here was the conversation it started about our book on the front page of the FT Companies and Markets. The CEO of a hedge fund that was a pioneer in catastrophe bonds hit out and said that Professor Darsikowski doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, so, like, that's pretty scary. Uh, you know, it's clearly not an issue of consensus, these uh, co-creations that I'd done, and I'd spent a lot of years in the field co-creating. I had a 
advisory panel. I had a chairman who was the CEO of an insurance group, uh, but somehow um, what I'd said was pretty contentious. And uh, it's tempting to think, well, CEOs of hedge funds earn way more than I'm ever going to, so they must know and I must be wrong. Except I was pretty confident in our science. So you start to probe, why are they so upset? No smoke without fire, huh? Um, and certainly it got me an awful lot of public publicity. Uh, I was on, you know, New York News, Bloomberg Morning News and things like that. But, you know, the latest research I have, and as we did this report I told you about with our impact object, our PGEs, is we gave them an object to focus on. But that doesn't mean they're all happy about it. Here's some of the things that came out from our 2018 report and uh, launch. You know, we're unhappy about them. We're going to fight them tooth and nail, or they should be avoided. They have unintended consequences. We're not doing those things. So does that mean that the thing I've found is a bad thing? Or does it mean I should find out why is there so much tension in this field around this question? And it points you to important questions. I began to then study why, why do they have unintended consequences? What do we know about that uh, in our research? Because we know a lot about how things stimulate unintended consequences and feedback loops that might help to move this field on. And we've just released a book on disaster insurance reimagined, which actually looks at some of these unintended consequences. So I guess what I'm saying to you is when you see something that practitioners don't like, co-creation is not this neutral, pleasant, let's all get the practitioners to tell us their questions. I mean, we're not there to be co-opted. We're actually there to help move a field forward and to invite reflexive dialogue. And as part of that, um, most of the time, nobody is going to celebrate you as a hero. Uh, and policymakers are not going to take your advice. Uh, the latest book that we have, we deliberately wrote for policymakers. It's a major problem around the world. We got an open grant from the European Union to make it open mm. access. I've certainly sent it to every politician I can think of. I wouldn't say that they're running out to welcome me with open arms. They're busy making unintended consequences. And I think that the important thing that you have to remember is we have to think like climate scientists. If we want to make a difference to companies, what they do, how they can do things better to society, then if you're a climate scientist, you'd have given up by now, right? Because well, you're not having much impact. The only change that's happening is climate change. So is that because they're not impactful or is it because impact takes a lot of courage, a lot of persistence, but also a lot of humility about the fact that these interdependent systems you know, will have unintended consequences and even your actions will have unintended consequences. So I think about what do you want to impact? Why do you want to impact it? And how can you participate in that field to support its transitions? Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Paula. That's both inspiring, but also cautionary. I really like the concept of impact objects and that, that warning to the translation comes too late. It's not a linear process. It's something which begins very early in the research process. So thank you very much, Paula. I think it might be wise for us to move on immediately to Joe, just to keep an eye on time. Um, I see there's lots of chat coming in, and please do especially put questions to Paula. She's, I think you've got your eye on the chat function there, not your email for the morning. So please do put uh, um, everything in the chat. Joe, thank you very much. I can see two slides there. You may not intend that. Oh, okay. I think you're not on presentation <laughs> mode. That better or that's perfect. That's good. Thank okay, you. great. Over to you, Jay. Hey, thank you. So, uh, in discussing uh, rigorous research and relevant practice today, I have a lot of comments that will be connected to the various speakers uh, up till now. So, uh, first thing I would say is that the the new journal, the Strategic Management Review, and I see uh, one of the editors, uh, Michael Liebline, and then Tammy Madsen and I are co-editors. We're, we're really uh, very interested in research uh, that's kind of connected to Herbert Simon's call a long time ago in administrative behavior and still relevant today is that the central mission of management is to advance an analytical rigor and to enlighten practical relevance, although it's quite an elusive a combination to achieve. So I think a lot of our discussion today has been how to reduce the research practice gap. 
to refocus on real world strategic problems. So Denise Rousseau has made the analogy, it's like focusing on the patient and medicine or Nickerson and uh, Zenger are making the analogy of focus on problem solving and engineering. Also, it's kind of connected to uh, the, the book on Pastor's Quadrant by Donald Stokes and talking about uh, the natural sciences uh, commented that a lot of, it's not actually thinking of basic science and uh, technological innovation and commercialization as being separate activities, but a lot of the technological innovations that were commercialized actually came from a basic science research, which is also kind of a emphasis that Herbert Simon has made over the years. So to achieve Pastor's quadrant, we need to return to, a, as, as discussed by the other speakers here today with uh, Julian, uh, Paul, and, and uh, Rudolph, that that's going to take uh, participative participative forms of research by obtaining advice and perspectives of key stakeholders like researchers, users, clients, and practitioners. So it's what Andy Vandeven in his uh, 2007 uh, award-winning uh, Academy of Management book called Engaged Scholarship. And I would say that many of our uh, presidential addresses at the Academy of Management have carried on that theme. So Gene Bartunek at Boston College, Don, Don Hambrick, uh, at the Penn State, Ann Huff, uh, uh, Dwayne Ireland at Texas A&M, and Denise uh, Rousseau at Carnegie Mellon. So different types of problems have been emphasized today. So for example, Martin uh, emphasized that we have a knowledge transfer problem, uh, but it goes also beyond that too, to think about science and practice as distinct forms of knowledge. And then we'll get to the knowledge production problem, which I think has been the, uh, the focus of uh, Julian Rudolph and all of today. So in thinking about science and practice as distinct forms of knowledge, an outstanding book on that subject was Michael Pogliani's Personal Knowledge, who persuasively argued that scientific knowledge is quite distinct from tacit practical uh, uh, knowledge. And it kind of is kind of captured in C.S. Lewis's comment that a, a true analysis of comedy may not itself be funny so that the analysis of something and the experience of something are quite different or can be quite different. So Nanaka talks then about a pluralistic approach uh, in which science and practice are viewed as representing different types of knowledge that can provide complementary uh, insights for, uh, for understanding. And then Ann Hoff in her, her presidential address talks about all the typical a uh, research paper has a problem posed with little evidence of the prevalence of that problem in the real world. You have a single theoretical model without consideration of alternatives. You have a research design not informed by practitioners. And a lot of the results are of statistical significance provided without discussing uh, their practical significance. So we had uh, some possibilities for uh, being more connecting uh, research and practices, uh, as Paula was talking about, is having collaborative research or co-creation of knowledge. An example of that would be uh, the SMJ paper by Bergelman and Andy Grove in uh, 2007, where they co-created uh, a paper about innovation. We also have, uh, I, I noticed in the chat, uh, Michael Liebelein mentioned about design science. So Denise Rousseau, uh, her presidential address was on evidence-based management and really from a design science perspective. And she also mentioned, uh, going back to the medicine example, again, the Cochrane collaboration. Uh, so she kind of sees uh, being more relevant through systematic reviews and meta-analyses that can kind of connect practitioners to research uh, through those methodologies. And then I would also mention, uh, when I didn't have a slide for, but I think Julian's uh, mentioning about the action research uh, and being more connected literally to the problem of the practitioner. Uh, as a matter of fact, Herbert Simon with uh, Jack Muth and Medigliani had a book on uh, inventory uh, mm -hmm. problems that came from the Pittsburgh uh, Plate Glass Company in Pittsburgh. So that once again, it's kind of the Pasteur's quadrant idea that sometimes fundamental, in this example, fundamental ideas from linear programming uh, came from real world problems of inventory by the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company. So action research can be there too. Uh, I think the one that uh, Ru uh, Rudy uh, emphasizes the informed basic research, and that's uh, certainly uh, the, the engaged scholarship approach of thinking about the, using the basic social science, but 
being informed by relevant uh, stakeholders. So, uh, and also having more of a problem, instead of looking at it, as mentioned before, instead of looking just at a gap in a theory, also looking at things starting with the problem, being grounded in reality that the practitioners have, then moving on to theory building that's actually relevant, building categories and theories that are relevant for the problem at hand, then designing a research design that connects to the theory, and then finally having hopefully something to say about uh, mitigating or remedying the problem that was the original problem formulation. So to kind of finish up, I'll uh, leave it with uh, Ned Bowman's kind of comment. Uh, he was an esteemed SMS fellow and he was at Wharton in, when he wrote this in 1990. There is always the risk that the professor would, uh, and also uh, my mentor too, there's always the risk that the professor would rather interact intellectually with other professors and doctoral students than with executives. While the first interaction is obviously worthwhile, to miss the second is folly. Professional business schools, as with all professional schools, exist to help the professions, the managers and the managers to be. So the practitioner and the research, I like this idea, they're doubly linked. The researcher supplies insights, relationships, and theory for the practitioner, but the practitioner supplies puzzles, ideas, judgments, and priorities for the researcher. And I would also argue that in the history of the management field, engaged scholarship is a time-tested knowledge production process that works. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Super. Um, I'm going to remember Pastor's quadrant and also the C.S. Lewis thing about, she raises the question, can we both be funny and analytical, I suppose? <laughs> Just, I, I struggle. Um, does anyone have any quick question for Joe, virtual hand or whatever, before we hand over to Martin? Uh, by, by the way, uh, Richard, I, I would mention that the, there are some videos uh, by Jerry Seinfeld, and it's about it's about almost like the the science of comedy. So so I would say that there are some practitioners of comedy who also think very deeply about the, if you will, the philosophy of comedy. Okay, well that sounds fascinating for the YouTube uh, search this evening. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, Joe. Thank Any. You. I can hear somebody wanting to speak, I think. Or not. No. Okay. Joe, I keep an eye on the chat. I think there are quite a lot of things coming through. I I don't know whether how Martin feels, whether he's blushing from all this discussion of practitioners and so on and so forth, or whether he wants finally to jump in after all these academics have had their say and tell us how it really is. Martin, you're going to represent BCG and the practitioners. And yes. you may have time to reflect on other things. Uh, yeah, nobody told me I had to be funny and uh, meaningful today, but I'll, uh, I'll do, do my best to, to do both. Um, so my little presentation is about my perspective as, as, a, as a translator, if you like. I'm the uh, thing that's shuttling forth between theory uh, and, and a client service business. And um, I want to talk about the idea of having it all, that this these trade-offs that people worry about, about rigor, relevance, accessibility, and appeal, we can, we, we can actually um, have, it, uh, have it all. Um, I'll skate over the first few slides because I want to um, focus on solutions rather than problems, but um, start on a hopeful note. I, I do agree with the late Clay Christensen that managers are absolutely voracious consumers of, of theory, and I'd say that that is especially true today when we have uh, AI, geopolitics, social division, lots of other things that are overturning um, our, our theories of business. Um, so I think we've got a very good playing field, if you like, for this uh, bridging exercise that we're undertaking uh, t today. Um, however, just because uh, the field is potentially relevant doesn't make it actually irrelevant. And uh, I think this echoes some of what's been said today. I think uh, a theory is valuable to practice only if it unifies disparate phenomena if it provides a frame and a language for discussion, um, if it triages, discriminates between different plausible explanations, and uh, the application or practices uh, only completes the virtuous cycle if new phenomena are highlighted, new questions are raised, if uh, theories are, are tested. So how are we doing today? Uh, I think really the field is not doing tremendously well in, in bridging this divide, and I'd offer us uh, some sort of um, intuitive evidence, evidence of that. Um, how many senior practitioners do we see at SMS conferences? 
Um, how often do we see executives or journalists reaching out to the field of strategy management for interpretation and uh, meaning of the of the phenomena which are shaping society and uh, and and business today and perhaps most damningly here's a little uh, survey I carried, carried out at the uh, Hyderabad um, SMS conference um, I wanted to to uh, carry it out uh, for on practitioners and academics but in fact there were not, not enough practitioners so I had to do the practitioner sample um, la later and um, you can see that in the view of um, um, academics um, uh, they don't necessarily see themselves in the strategy field as focusing on practitioner relevant uh, topics, uh, communicating uh, effectively, and, and so on. So I, I do think there is a, a problem which affects the health and relevance of the field to be to be solved here. Um, I won't dwell on the uh, on the problems. Um, I think they are multiple and and span um, all um, uh, all stages of this uh, uh, process, the steps of the process. Uh, in the uh, chart from the last speaker, but that uh, go from phenomena through to uh, theories and, and, and tested theories. Um, uh, the fact that the academics are playing to an academic audience rather than a practitioner audience, for example, jargon and obscurity, uh, conflating formality with um, a lack of accessibility and, 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 to, uh, and, and conflating it with, uh, with rigor and, and so on and so on. But, let me um, you use my time mainly um, on to suggest a few ideas on what I've learned from uh, my, my translation role about how to uh, bridge this gap that we've all spoken about today. Um, so I, I'm interested in breaking the uh, trade-offs between um, relevance and rigor, um, but also I, I, I'd add a third dimension, which is accessibility or appeal. I think in a in a crowded information environment, we have to positively appeal to our audience rather than merely be uh, relevant and, and rigorous. Um, so some of the things that um, uh, I try to bear in mind um, in, in my role is um, getting into the world, um, uh, making sure that I'm talking about the things that are not interesting to me or my immediate circle or my academic advisors, but to um, understand how practitioners are talking about events, this, this term lay ontolo ontology uh, resonates. And uh, being phenomenon driven, I think it's very easy as a researcher to be wrapped up in what is um, uh, interesting rather than trying to explain a, a phenomenon that is uh, happening in the real world. I, I think thinking about the incentives, I often talk to PhD students and academics about why do you study what you study? And a lot of what I hear is, um, well, I have I am constrained to study this because this is publishable or this is not publishable or I have to follow my super advise, supervisor's advice. I, I believe that business schools where uh, where many of you teach have uh, perhaps uh, on average slightly more academic freedom than uh, than other faculties. And, and so we can shift those incentives away from the sort of publication machine type incentives more towards practical relevance. It's, it's and I, and I, and I know a couple of schools that have uh, uh, done this. Um, I think, as somebody mentioned, I think teaching is, um, um, uh, you know, I think there are some natural crossover zones um, where uh, both the practitioner and the academic perspective come into play. I think um, executive teaching is one of them. And I think making sure that um, we're not just teaching last year or last decade syllabus, but that our, our, our strategy course is, um, is absolutely up to date in terms of the, the phenomena it addresses and the and the theories that are brought into into play and i think fundamentally the discipline of researching the topic portfolio uh, one of my academic colleagues told me a joke about um, um uh, academics uh, sitting under the working under the same light bulb that illuminated their um uh, their, their the paper upon which they wrote their phd thesis and adding that uh, the light bulb itself burnt out several years ago um, as a sort of very depressing image of, of a sort of lack of turnover in, in research themes. But I think we, uh, we all need to refresh uh, our topics uh, to achieve what we're trying to hear. I think on, on rigor, I think testing ideas in practice is important. Um, this is not always possible statistically uh, because of course there are many variables and things are constantly changing and we don't have uh, quantitative data on uh, everything that we would wish. Uh, but there is this interesting quirk in business that uh, business seeks to not only um, understand and prove, but but pilots uh, actually tests ideas by operationalizing them and, and testing business models based on ideas. But that, of course, requires 
uh, insider access that requires uh, trust. And so I think um, a very big part of, of uh, common denominator of what we're talking about today is facilitating the, the flow of people and ideas which would uh, permit that to happen. And I think in that context, the, uh, the, 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 the crossover community, the, the former academics that now work in, in business or the business executives that have become academics or uh, those taking a temporary sojourn in, uh, in the other camp uh, play a vital role here because uh, they not only have knowledge of these problems, but they have an incentive to, uh, uh, to solve them. Um, in terms of um, making ideas accessible and, and, and appealing, um, I, I, I think, um, I, I, I mean, how, how many of us read uh, uh, SMJ for fun or, or would um, uh, recommend an SMJ um, article um, for, uh, in order that when, when we could illuminate a, a practitioner colleague on a, on a phenomenon or an idea, um, I think, as, as Richard Feynman, the, the physicist, said, if you if you can't explain it plainly and clearly, then you you probably don't understand it. I, I think a lot of what is um, tied up in the rigmarole of of uh, of, of, of uh, academic paper writing is is unnecessarily obscure. Seemingly, my own conversations, even to academics themselves, I mean, these the average uh, uh, quantitative strategy paper is not a not a fun read and um i think that's a, an important part of the the the, the, the problem um, i think creating trading zones is very important uh, um, if we could get a um, 100 more um, senior practitioners along to a an sms conference would they be comfortable would they see it as a as a, as a an equal playing field where they could uh, uh, contribute their um, knowledge, which, as somebody has said, is in a in a slightly different form. Um, we need to design our conferences and inter interaction zones, our trading zones, uh, with uh, uh, with that in mind. And um, I think we need to communicate. I've, I've, I've written communicate fractally. What I mean by that is, um, you know, write the tweet, the tweet, write the wink LinkedIn article, uh, write the practitioner article, um, write the extended white paper. I think we need to communicate in. Uh, and on many different um, scales in order to uh, have an idea uh, take, take hold. Um, I just want to finish by highlighting um, an initiative which um, uh, uh, several of the people on this call are involved in too, um, which is uh, a series of events um, called Untamed Issues in Strategy. Um, uh, I think my, I saw Michael uh, Leibline, um on, on the call, perhaps he can uh, have some amplifying comments, but essentially what we're trying to do is to create um, unusual forums where there are 50% academics and 50% senior practitioners uh, present, um, normally chief strategy officers, and the aim is not to uh, pitch the latest uh, uh, theory of, 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 of one of the academics, but rather to discuss what is it that we don't know or haven't institutionalized or codified, uh, but need to, and do that from a uh, an equal perspective with, with equal airtime for academics and uh, and practitioners in an attempt to bridge the gap and we've so we've held one of those events in uh, New York we're aiming to launch a survey on what are the untamed issues we're going to uh, have another event in uh, San Francisco this uh, uh, this summer and I, I think this uh, um, it's only a fraction of what is required, but hopefully this will be a, a contribution to, to bridging the gap. So uh, thank you for inviting me to opine on this really uh, crucial topic that affects our field, I think. Thank you so much, Martin. And, and very nice to have an authoritative view and a connected, engaged view from practice. I don't know whether I don't know whether Michael's still with us, but if he is and he wants to say anything more about the untamed issues in strategy, then he is invited to now. I, I, you there, Michael? I won't say anything. I'm going to put something in the chat and let you run this. So perfect. perfect. I'm going to put our uh, document. But another concept that I, I'm taking from this, and a number of concepts from what Martin talked about, was one was communicating factually, which I think picks up with what Paula was talking about. You know, there's little fragments of, of communications as we go along. And another was this. Um, crossover community and i think that speaks to mika i'm going to mispronounce your name Lipionen. you i think are a self-declared crossover as an entrepreneur i think um and i i think the um categorization of academic business consulting is far too rigid to describe what we have in practice 
And there are many, there's a large crossover community who can um, play a very important role here. So would anyone like to make any further observations? We're running actually to time. I think I, I, I owe Paula an apology. I could have let you um, take a few questions earlier. Um, excuse me, Paula, I suddenly got paranoid. Um, so any questions to Paula, especially Martin or indeed anybody else, that would be great. Um, and I gather there's some more chat coming in, which is super, if anyone wants to do that. Would anyone like to uh, add a further word to what they've heard from the panel as well? Virtual hands, ideally, but um, failing that. Anyone would like to offer a further word? Martin, can I ask you a direct question? I think Please. you're quite unu unusual in the consulting community. Um, if it's not too personal a question, why aren't there more Martin Reeves? Um, I think it's a hard place to stand, right? Because in some ways, I'm a, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, bona fide academic. In some ways, I'm not a bona fide practitioner. Um, so uh, I, I think. Um, BCG has the good sense to not have me drive a PL, so I, I can I have a certain amount of uh, uh, you know time and latitude to to pursue these sorts of questions. Um, uh, but it's hard to maintain that license because I too am bridging this rigor commercial relevance gap. I think that's the reason. I think in in, in a sense we've all become too too simplistically instrumental. I mean those academics that have accepted the full pressures of the publication machine and and, and use that as an excuse not to pursue, re, re, you know, re, relevant uh, practical phenomena. I mean, I think that's that's a lame excuse. And I think uh, the same goes for consultants who um, have, who've uh, you know demand immediate commercial relevance uh, uh, from, from from all ideas and don't have the patience to explore. I think it's a sort of a, an impatience that is not useful for long term progress. Okay. I saw Paula had her hand up. I don't know whether you'd like to comment on what Martin was saying or, or some other thread of conversation. Uh, no, I just put my hand up a little earlier. I think one of the things that's really come out from this and also in the chat is, you know, how do we incentivize and enable early career scholars who are taking sort of maybe this hybrid role that Martin has or even going down the direct route, uh, but to feel valued when they develop the white paper or when they engage because we know that that's going to happen before the publication. For those of us doing this work, which is on this, everyone on this call, we know that we'll develop the better publications and the better science, but we don't really have ways to recognise it until after the science has been produced. Um, and I'd love to see us revise our own incentive structures in ways that would let us reward and also guide people from impact to high quality science because they're, you know, they're integral. Yeah, I think that's really important. I remember hearing from some hiring committee that, uh, oh, they got an HBR. They're assistant professor. They shouldn't have that. They're not serious. It wasn't yours at LBS. Don't worry, Julian. <laughs> but it, it, it's the sort of thing I think we can all recognise at many that's institutions. Yes. Do you want to do more than shake your head? So well, I mean, I, I, gosh, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've almost given up the idea that we would try to persuade our pre-tenure colleagues to do uh, practitioner-oriented research. I mean, the, the the hurdles and the challenges of academia are so huge that 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 we we do need to give everybody a chance to to meet whatever that standard is. But but once you've got tenure. I really would love us to be much more open-minded about the types of pathways that you can take as a tenured member of faculty. And, and clearly, you know, continuing down the academic publishing route is one way, but you know, there's certainly more kind of, you know, do what interests you and, and publish in, in all sorts of different places. Surely that should be equally celebrated. That's my, my personal view on this. And I certainly intend to be, doing a little bit more of that uh, when I'm when I'm helping to shape things at Ivy you know, in the years ahead. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the whole point of tenure, to be able to do yeah, exactly. what you can do freely. That's the reason yeah. why you have that. 
Does anyone else want to comment? Uh, not all deans are, are totally liberal <laughs> on these things. Some deans that I know are very focused on the FT48 journals. So, uh... well, But the good thing about the FT list is that it does include Harvard Business Review and Sloan Management Review, for example. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's not impossible to, 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 to fulfill your FT sort of objectives as well as doing, doing some of the things we've been talking about. Yeah, okay. Anybody else then? Anything coming up from, thank you, Michael, for that really inspiring list of um, untamed issues. Um, I was copying and pasting it just a moment ago. And Michael, to a certain extent, I think st uh, Strategic Management Review has been very active on this issue of practice academic interaction. I know you published a paper by Martin, by Julian and myself on this. So does anyone want to comment on that? Martin, uh, Michael? I, mean, I, I, I worry about this as a, as a sort of a change problem. I mean, I think we've agreed, uh, seemingly looking at the chat and listening to today's presentations, we've, we've agreed um, um, fairly remarkably and, and smoothly on the, on the problem and the solution. Making it happen against the uh, incentives in, in the... Uh, in the systems of, of um, practitioners and and academics is is, is a different matter. Um, you know, it, there's there's probably a couple of, of of routes that we could collectively boost the, the the change effort here if we're serious. I mean, one might be to create that list of um, like the list that Michael's put in the chat of um, you know the untamed issues of strategy that we should be working on because those are the things that the practitioners say they need or um, Another one might be, um, you know, I think I think the business school model is coming under pressure with shifts in in demographics, and per perhaps money will speak and cause business schools to think about how to be more relevant. Um, I think a lot of interesting collective knowledge has been shared today from our individual experiences. I'm wondering whether that could be perhaps codified in the form of some sort of manifesto of the practitioner oriented business school a blueprint for a practitioner oriented business school that for those business schools that want to move in this direction would you know facilitate progress um uh, perhaps this 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 list is more incomplete than it's complete but but i mean i wonder what we can do collectively to not only agree on the diagnosis but but actually move things forward challenge to you julian as an incoming dean what well, exactly <laughs> I'm not going to try to answer it right now. There, I mean, this is it. I mean, of course, deans have so many, con, you know, conflicting sort of challenges, um, and even even those who want to to do do some of this stuff, they, yeah, you've got to. There's it's always a balance, and there's only so much scope you have to influence what your your colleagues are actually doing. Anyway, so I I'm not going to pretend to feel I've got all the answers. You come back, well, come back in five years, Richard, and and ask me how <laughs> I can help. Yeah, I'm sure you'll make progress. But whether you'll crack the problem for everybody, that's a big challenge. Yeah, okay, well, good luck with that, and thank you. thank you very much to everybody for participating. A very lively chat and a, a constructive chat with lots of useful extra material. So thank you to everybody. I'm sorry about the timing issue. But um, we are now time to, to, to finish off. It's, I think it's quite late for Louise. It's still early for Paula. So um, we ought to let everybody get on with their days. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.